Glendora Unified. Mike Schaub has been not only a Glendora High graduate, but um, a longtime member of Social Model Recovery Systems. It's one of our strongest partners that helps us when he, we have kids that use or parents that need help counseling and helping their child through um, the struggles of being a teen. Social Model Recovery is just always there for us. They lead a cessation group on Whitcomb campus. Um, they've led many counseling sessions for us and um, they provide all kinds of support. So I want to introduce to you one of our members of the Coordinated School to Health Committee, Mike Shaw. Hey everybody, thank you for introduction. Mike Schaub when I was around this campus because I was in trouble a lot. It was probably Michael. <laughs> but, um, so Mr. We're here tonight, and, and I'll tell you that Melissa did a fantastic job in introducing this evening, so I'll just give you really quick. I wanted to just reiterate real quick the relationship with Social Model Recovery Systems and the community and Glendora High School and, and Glendora Schools in general. We're going to do whatever we can to help people that are struggling with use, abuse, or addiction issues, and we can do that in a confidential way. Absolutely. And tonight you'll see uh, when Dr. Smith does his presentation, he'll integrate some education into the help that we offer to the community. But we want you to know definitely we, would, we can help you with confidential phone calls or in any way to, to get someone the help that they need, whether it's in this room or outside this room or in the community or a family member, whether it's an adult or a child or an adolescent, we'll do whatever we can to help, okay? so. Tonight, your presenter is Dr. John Smith, and uh, a warm introduction for the Director of Education for Social Model Recovery Systems, Dr. Smith. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Welcome, parents. Welcome, students. Welcome some of my uh, own students that are here tonight that uh, have a double duty of being part of Glendora system and actually being students of mine at Mount San Antonio College where I'm a professor of drug and alcohol counseling. So I train students to become addiction counselors and part of what I do in the job that I have at Mount SAC uh, is to educate and part of what I do at my job at Social Model Recovery Systems is to educate. So I think I'm in the right place for educating. So tonight is one of my favorite topics, which is the brain. What, does anybody know what that is up there? <coughs> that looks like a head of cauliflower, I don't know. Any vegetarians in the audience that might, what, what is that a picture of up there, anybody? Brain. It's the brain, right? How many of you have one? <laughs> okay, well good, That's, I, I, think, I think most of you have one or should have one, or at least part of one, right? So we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about the brain, but we're going to talk specifically about how drugs hijack the brain. The word hijack means it takes over. So literally for some people when they use drugs, alcohol being a drug, tobacco or nicotine being a drug, when they use drugs, the drugs or the effect of the drug actually takes over the brain. And I'm going to show you how that happens. And I'm going to explain why that happens. And I'm going to do it in a way I think that will be fun. And I'm going to expect, at times, your participation. Is that OK? All right. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about opioids a little bit. But the presentation is really going to apply to drugs in general across the board. The reason that I added opioids to the presentation was because, as many of you may have heard, if you read the news or you look at Facebook or you look at any of the, 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 the media right now, they're all talking about what we call an opioid epidemic or an opioid crisis, which means that people are dying in droves overdosing from these particular drugs, in, in particular opioids. So we're going to talk a little bit quickly about what those are, and then I'll get into the fun stuff, which is the brain and how these drugs, as well as others, actually hijack the brain. We don't want that to happen. So I'll, I'll, and also, please feel free at any time 
I would encourage you to ask questions. We'll have time at the end to have some questions and answers, but I'm one of those guys that sort of likes to go as we, as we flow along. So if you have any questions, regardless of what they are, please feel free to ask them as we go around. You've heard the term opiate and you've heard the term opioid, right? So what's the difference? Well, opioid refers to all synthetic opiates and natural ones. It talks about opiates basically come from the poppy plant. They are derived directly from the poppy and so they are uh, drugs such as heroin, morphine. Anybody been in the hospital re recently? Have any surgery or had a broken anything at all? Work at all? Well if you did your doctor probably at some point prescribed you one of these medications. Now, of course, we've all heard about heroin. Heroin is a drug that you typically find on the street and people use it, but it does the same thing as the medication, the, the hydrocodone, the, the Vicodin, or the oxycodone, or the oxycontin, which are the medications that are used to treat pain. They're called analgesics. So if you've been to the doctor, you've broken an arm, you've had surgery, you've had major dental work, work prescribe something like this for your pain. How many of you got addicted when you took it? Anybody? Good. You did? Okay. So when you got addicted when you took it is because your brain is different than the person that was in the bed next to you that got the same medication. What was different was that you felt something that they didn't. And you may feel bad because it happened to you and it didn't happen to them. You may go, well, what's wrong with me? Well, you're going to find out that nothing was wrong with you except that your brain was wired differently for some reasons, which we'll explain later, and that's why it happened to you, but it didn't happen to grandma who broke her hip, or it didn't happen to the person that was in the bed next to you recovering from the same surgery, or who had the same dental work, took the same medications, and all of a sudden something happened to you that didn't happen to them. So I appreciate your honesty for sharing that because that's really going to make a, a big uh, statement for what I'm about to say tonight. So these drugs are legal, they're prescribed, they're used for the treatment of pain, used appropriately for most people, they don't cause addiction. But for some people, they do. And some of the drugs have changed, and so some of the drugs that are out there are, let's just say, so strong that more people are becoming addicted to them and misusing them because of the way some of those drugs are manufactured, made, and the way that they're marketed. And that's, that's a different presentation in general, but I just want you to know that we're seeing an increase in overdose deaths People are dying. Why do you think they're dying? Why are they overdosing? Don't they know better? Well, one of the reasons that they're overdosing is because there are, is stuff being put into the drugs that they don't know is there. One of the things that is being put into heroin, it's being put into some of the uh, pills that are being sold on the street, is a drug called fentanyl. How many of you have heard of fentanyl before? So fentanyl is about a hundred times stronger than heroin. It's cheap. It's manufactured primarily in China and it is cheap. So it's being sent over to the people that are mixing up the drugs to cut it, to sell it, and they're mixing it in with the heroin because it's a nice little white powder just like the heroin. They're mixing it in and crushing it up and putting it into pills some of you may have uh, heard about the Angels pitcher, Tyler Skaggs, and he died, uh, unfortunately, he asphyxiated on his own vomit because he died uh, in his sleep because whatever he had in his system, uh, his system was trying to get rid of, he vomited and he choked to death on that. Sounds awful, doesn't it? Uh, but when they 
did the drug screen, they found he had alcohol, he had OxyContin, and he had fentanyl in his system. Well, I'll bet you a hundred bucks he didn't know that when he took that OxyContin that it had fentanyl in it. And so the combination of that and alcohol killed him, right? So, and so we don't know what's in the stuff that they say is in the stuff. And now they're putting stuff in the drugs that are, is even more deadly, and that's why we see more people that are starting to die from drug overdoses, in particular dr drug overdoses from opioids, all right? So, I'm going to go past the opioids, unless you have any questions specifically about the opioids. I want to get into the brain and what's going on in there, because it doesn't matter what drug it is, it just matters what's going on inside the brain. That's why you came here tonight. So, did you know that we have three brains? Some of you didn't even know you had one, right? We actually have three brains. And you're gonna like this, kids, because you can go home and anything you do, you can blame it on one of these brains. <laughs> right? And your parents can't do anything about it because it's probably true. Right? So at the deepest base of your brain is the part that we all share with pretty much every living creature. It's called the reptilian brain. What's a reptile? Lizard. I call it lizard brain, right? Lizards, snakes, anybody like to watch the, the alligator uh, hunter show, right? Swamp people, right? They always shoot in the alligator in this little tiny little spot because that's, that's how big the alligator's brain is. Alligators are reptile. So this Reptiles have this little part of the brain, and do you know what the purpose of that part of the brain is? That part of the brain keeps you alive. It causes you to breathe, it causes your heart to beat, it makes all of your vital functions function. And one of its primary purposes, and what it, we share as humans with all of these other creatures, is that it has what's called the fight or flight response. Does anybody know what that is? So when something happens that startles you, scares you, your, your reptilian brain goes, run! Right? Or when you're watching those scary Halloween movies and somebody jumps out, you go, ah! it startles you, right? So <clears throat> that is your reptilian brain doing its job. It says, Run, fight, flee, get out of the way. So when the reptilian brain is doing its job, all of these chemicals are going through your body. Adrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine, all of these, all of these chemicals are surging through your body trying to give you more energy to get away from the thing that's trying to eat you or scare you on TV even though it's not trying to eat you in reality unless you like uh, Walking Dead or something like that, and then maybe, but, all right. So now, over time, the second part of the brain developed and grew over the top of the lizard brain, or it's also known as the mammalian brain. Some of you kids that are in science would know what a mammal is, right? What's a mammal? Well, a mammal are, are most animals. So your dog's a mammal, your cat's a mammal, most rabbits are mammals, and wolves are mammals. And so the mammalian brain is, a, is in the middle of the brain. It grew over the top of the lizard brain so that mammals can do more things because they have more brain power to do it. So one of the things that they have There's our reptiles, all right? Now, the monkeys and other mammals have the mammalian brain, which allows them to do a couple of things, all right? Remember, the reptilian brain is at the stem, fight or flight. 
<coughs> on top of that is this midbrain in the middle there that contains all these fun little places that I've got outlined on here, and that's your survival brain. So in there is an area called the nucleus accumbens. Now that's a fun term. You can go home and impress all your friends tomorrow with, I learned about the nucleus accumbens. Why is the nucleus accumbens important? In particular. Because that's the area of the brain that is thought to be associated mostly with addiction. Why? Well, because when it gets activated, and I'll explain how that happens in a minute, but when it gets activated, it squirts out a substance, a, what's called a neurotransmitter, called dopamine. Anybody here ever hear of dopamine? Well, dopamine is considered the pleasure chemical because whenever you get a hit of dopamine, you feel good. Some brains, for reasons that I'll explain later, have more sensitive nucleus accumbens, so therefore some brains than others. And those brains that are more sensitive to more dopamine are going to be more reactive to drugs. Well, what do drugs do? Well, drugs, all every drug, every drug, some more than others, but every drug causes a huge spike in dopamine, and I'll explain this in a minute, but more dopamine is released in the certain brains when we take drugs than it is in any other thing that we do naturally. So drugs, because of dopamine, fool the brain into thinking that the drug is more important than anything natural, like food and thirst, reproduction, and other things, taking care of your baby, maternal instinct. It thinks that it's more important than those things, and so it drives the person to seek out the drug because it thinks that's more important for survival than all of those other things that were pre-programmed into us as natural. All has to do with dopamine, or at least that's the, that's the main system, right? So the nucleus accumbens is responsible for that. Now, the next door neighbor to the nucleus accumbens, and this is really important as well, is this little area called the amygdala, right? Do you know what a serial killer and a hero have in common? Anybody watch Criminal Minds or those shows? Okay. Do you know, do you know what a serial killer is? That's somebody who like <clears throat> goes out and, and kills a lot of people for whatever reason. And do you know what a hero is? But what do they have in common? Anybody want to guess? They're not afraid of death. They're not afraid of death. Well, that's partly correct. I don't know if they're afraid of death, but they all, both of them have small amygdalas. The amygdala is the emotional processing center of the brain. So when we experience something, especially if it's got a strong emotional content, if it's traumatic or disturbing, or if it's really good, your amygdala responds and it processes that information. If it's really overwhelming, sometimes the emotional overload of that experience gets stuck in the amygdala. How many of you have a computer or a television or some real expensive electrical device at home? Well, most of you, I bet, yeah. So hopefully if, if you're doing it correctly, you have those devices plugged into this little strip they call it a surge protector that you plug into the wall so that if there's a power surge that comes through the line into the house, it trips that circuit before it blows up all your great expensive electrical devices. We think, I, this is my, my theory, it's not scientifically proven yet, but our mind comes equipped with a surge protector as well. So that in the event that there is a, an experience that is emotionally overwhelming, traumatic, war, violence, rape, abuse, uh, accidents, uh, earthquakes, all of these things that are like <gasps> overwhelming, for some people it causes that circuit breaker, that surge protector to blow, and the emotion and the memory gets stuck right there in the amygdala. 
right? And its buddy back here, the hippocampus, is also important because that's like the video recorder of the mind. So everything that's associated with that experience gets recorded back here in the hippocampus and then it gets sent off into some long-term storage usually. But for some people, especially when those memories are very traumatic and disturbing emotionally, that gets stuck. And when it gets stuck, the person continues to be haunted by the memory and by the emotion and physical response associated with it. They experience it, or I should say re-experience it, as if it's still happening right now. So it could have been 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but when something triggers the memory, they re-experience it live like it's still happening. We call that condition post-traumatic stress disorder, which is very common. It's very common for people who have addiction problems to also have other emotional problems. One of the most common ones is post-traumatic stress disorder, right? So, in fact, one of the reasons that they may start using drugs and alcohol on a regular basis is they find that those substances actually are the only things they can find that relieve the emotional suffering and may quiet down some of the memories. So they, they, they use them and then what started out as a solution then becomes a problem. So more on that in a minute. So the amygdala then is the emotional processing center. Nucleus accumbens is the one where the sensitive one pushes out more dopamine and when these two start working together that causes addiction. Now what's going to cause the addiction is our primitive survival brain. Do <laughs> you know these guys? They go, I think they go to school here, I think they're seniors. <laughs> right? I think they're seniors here at school. And so they're sitting around in their cave one day, minding their own business, doing what they do, talking about going out and having fun tonight, they're going clubbing. Right? So they're, they're talking about what they're going to do and so they leave the cave and all of a sudden, wow! There's a saber-toothed tiger. Oh my gosh, what are they going to do? Well, what part of their mind or their brain kicks in? The amygdala kicks in, the nucleus accumbens kicks in, their lizard brain kicks in. So now all of a sudden it's fight or flight, right? There's another one too I didn't mention, it's called freeze. If fight isn't an option, flight isn't an option, sometimes freeze is the only option. Your brain determines which one of those will give you the best odds of survival, so you don't really control which one takes over. But in that, when that saber-toothed tiger comes up, boom, there is a, an emergency, fight or flight, and that part of the mind takes over. Right? So all kinds of things are happening until these guys get back in their cave. Once they get back in their cave, they're safe. So for most of us, our mind would return, eventually turn, return back to normal. Human mind, though, has the capacity to think backwards. So it can think backwards, and since our hippocampus has recorded everything that's happened, it replays the memory of what just happened. Well, when the memory plays, so does the emotion attached to it, and so this person, a human, has the capacity to think about things that have happened. Rabbits only have the capacity to think about what is happening. That's why I've never seen a rabbit in therapy, ever, <laughs> never. Rabbits don't have emotional problems that I know of because with replaying old memories and being disturbed emotionally by things that have happened or if you tend to have a little anxiety anybody here have anxiety yeah okay well do you know the two words in the English language that are going to guarantee you to have anxiety what and if if what if so if some of it is the mind stuck replaying old movies what do you think anxiety is thinking too far ahead about what if, what if, what if. Now see the rabbit part of your mind, remember the mammalian brain? 
where all of this stuff is? Well, it doesn't know that what you're thinking, it thinks whatever you're thinking is happening right now. Doesn't know it, it's over, it, it's done, it happened, or it hasn't happened yet, it may never happen, so it's producing energy and emotion, and all these chemicals are running through you based upon not what's happening, but what? A thought or a memory. That all making sense to you? All right. So these guys hopefully are not reprocessing what just happened. Did you see the saber-toothed tiger? Did you, did, you, did you zig or zag or, man, that was awful. We almost got eaten up. Well, they might be talking about that, and if they are, they might be experiencing some energy, emotion, based upon what just happened. Hopefully their brain turns back to normal so they can go about their business and they don't stay stuck in their cave because they're afraid maybe there'll be another one out there. Maybe I'll get eaten. What if, what if, what if? So, let's get down to the science a little bit. If a behavior is beneficial for survival, if a behavior is considered beneficial for survival, as I said, the brain records all of the information, the memories, the sights, the sounds, the smells, all of that is recorded in the various parts of the brain that I was talking about. So when it experiences these events, we haven't gotten back to drugs yet, remember I said drugs do this as well, but it everything that is beneficial for survival. We got away from the saber-toothed tiger and survived. <sighs> Dopamine. We escaped. We're safe. We're back in our cave. <sighs> Dopamine. We killed the saber-toothed tiger and now we have food to last all winter. <sighs> Dopamine. So whenever we engage in a behavior that benefits our survival, Mother Nature programs us to get this hit of dopamine to reward us because it knows that this is important, remember it, and repeat it. So a behavior that is rewarded, in other words, a behavior that is rewarded with dopamine causes you to feel something, to feel good, <sighs> and when it causes you to feel good, that's the sign for Mother Nature that says, remember this, I'm gonna make sure you remember it, and I'm gonna make sure that you repeat it, keep doing it, over and over and over again. The more you do it, the more dopamine I'm gonna give you, and that's gonna be good for your survival. All right, so the Behavior that is rewarded, or another term for that is reinforced, is more likely to be repeated. Now remember this, they're gonna, it's going to be on your test. Oh, there isn't going to be a test. So if a behavior is rewarded with dopamine, it's more likely to be repeated. What do you think's happening with her? She's rewarded. Dopamine going off here? Okay, a lot of it. Uh, those of you that were recently at the casino know about this, right? Those of you that lost, here's the interesting thing, those of you that lost at the casino, how long did you keep putting the money in the machine or on the table even though you weren't getting your dopamine? How long did you keep doing it anticipating that maybe this next time I'll get the dopamine? That's how Vegas works, by the way. They know about this. They've known about it for years, and they, it operates on this principle. So some people will keep putting money and money and money in, get, trying to get that dopamine. They're actually, they've done brain scans of people who are uh, what we call gambling use disorder or gambling disorder, basically gambling addiction, and their brain scan looks very similar to someone who is high on cocaine. So they actually consider the gambling use disorder as a actual addiction disorder. It's in the what we call the DSM, which is where they classify all the 
all the disorders, gambling is in there now because we know that gambling does the same thing that cocaine does or other drugs, right? So she's getting a dopamine hit. What do you think she's going to be doing? Gambling. She's going to keep on playing, right? Maybe I can get. Maybe I'll get more. She's probably not going to walk away and say, yeah, "I think I'll cash out and go home," right? So, the, bla the, the, brain, the brain registers all pleasures in the same way, whether they come from a drug or they come from natural things, a monetary reward like in gambling, or whether they come from a sexual encounter, a satisfying meal, all of those things that cause pleasure or reward cause to be surging through the brain, right? Some people more than others. Keep that in mind. Not everybody's brains are wired the same. So dopamine is excreted in the nucleus accumbens. I've said that. And when the dopamine gets excreted, then that, satis or that signals reward, and that causes all of that information to be stored so that it's easily accessible next time, right? So. It's so consistently tied with pleasure that neuroscientists actually call this particular had their dopamine triggered today. Oh, now it's not bad. <laughs> you all did, whether you know it or not. You, you, how many of you got out of bed today? I see some of you did, right? How many of you went to a job or went to school today? What made you do that? <laughs> dopamine. Coffee. Dopamine. Because dopamine also, one of it, besides pleasure, dopamine's other purpose is to motivate. Right? The reason the cavemen go out to seek food is because, one, they're hungry. Hungry is the body's way of signaling, go get food. When they leave to go get food, what's motivating them? What keeps them from sitting around in the cave all day doing nothing? So now if you've got somebody sitting at home, they probably need a little shot of dopamine. Right? Or they're doing something that is causing their dopamine to get redistributed or to get uh, to not be utilized properly. That could mean they're doing drugs. Not saying they are, but that could mean they're doing drugs because their normal motivation to seek out things that would be normal, like food, thirst, progress, job, work, production, all of those things that we are motivated to do, if they're not doing that, it means something's going on with them that is keeping them from having those reactions. That could be drugs. Could be other things, but it could be drugs. Okay. So, here's what happens when we put drugs into our system. And again, I'm talking about alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine, and a whole bunch of others that I haven't mentioned, but the, you, get the, you get the idea, right? So these are the drugs that people use to get, what's the word? High. They use these drugs. What does that mean? What's high? When somebody gets high, what does that mean? elevated. They, it causes them to feel different. Usually it causes them to feel good. So feeling high is equivalent to feeling really good. What is causing them to feel really good when they use the drug? Dopamine. So they're getting a dopamine surge when they use the drug which is causing them to feel high. Now some people their brain is set up so that they 
are more prone or likely to get high or feel high when they use one of these substances. Now, I'll guarantee you if you use enough of those substances long enough, you'll all get high. And if you use enough of them long enough, many of you, not all of you, but many of you would become addicted. But some people are addicted more quickly, more easily, because their brain is more likely to respond because of their nucleus accumbens, respond differently <clears throat> and produce more dopamine than general. Does that, that all make sense? Okay, so if we realize that the brain is natural rewards for doing natural things, let's just say that eating a good meal, satisfying meal, your fa think of your favorite food and right in front of you, you're really hungry and here's your favorite meal and, and you look at it and you're like, oh wow, I can't wait and you taste it, you put it in your mouth and it just, oh, it's just amazing and tastes great and, right? So your brain is saying that feel, that's good and it makes you feel good, right? It gives you dopamine, that's a normal reward. You use a drug the difference between that feeling you got when you ate your favorite food and the feeling you get when you use the drug, there's no comparison. Now that may sound like, wow, I can't wait to go home and use drugs. <laughs> but there's a problem with this, all right? I'll get to that. So you will feel good, but I'll just tell you what goes up must come down, all right? So it doesn't last for very long. The feeling might last for a little while, but then you gotta, when it wears off, you gotta use the drug again. And then over time, when you bombard your system with drugs, and when it's bombarded and, and overwhelmed with all this dopamine, it starts to not respond as well. All right. Who's ticklish in here? A volunteer? No. All right. No, yeah, she's hiding back. They're not me. All right. So, can you imagine if you're really ticklish, somebody coming up to you, maybe your sister or brother or somebody, yeah, I see that, yeah, I see it, okay. So, they come up to you and they start tickling you. What's the first thing that you do besides scream? <laughs> right? You, you pull, you try to get away, right? And they still keep tickling you, tickling you, and then you start to cry and scream and yell and you know, hopefully then, but you keep trying to get away and eventually maybe you get away. And you go tell mom and dad and they laugh, right? <laughs> so that some people, when they are using drugs, those drugs are tickling all of their, not to get too technical here, but they're, they're called receptor sites. So in your brain you have these little places that when the dopamine and other chemicals get released, they get sucked into these little receptor sites so that they keep doing their job. Well, the drugs overwhelm these receptor sites and cause, over time, it's like being tickled, it causes those receptor sites to diminish or retreat or re retract themselves, so then there are fewer of them available. Well, so if I want to keep feeling that feeling, what do I have to do? If I've got fewer receptor sites and I want that dopamine to tickle me, what, what's going to happen? What do I have to do? You have to it with what? Yes, I have to use more to get the same effect. That is called tolerance. Now, the bad news is when you get to the point in using drugs where you develop tolerance, meaning it takes more of the drug to get the same effect, that's an indicator that you have become addicted. Because if you were to stop using the drug, you would experience cravings, you would experience probably to, to some level, maybe to an extensive level, withdrawal symptoms where you start getting sick when you stop using it, and you would do anything to get more of the drug, 
And when that happens, that's when you have developed what we call an addiction or a physical dependency as well as the psychological dependency on the drug. So when we think of what is going on in the brain when it's happening, the addictive drug can release two to ten times more dopamine than anything natural. So your brain starts to prefer what? It starts preferring the drug because it has fooled nature into thinking that the drug is more important than anything natural and therefore the person starts seeking the drug and doing less of the things that they should be doing because the brain doesn't think those are as important anymore. So the drug has hijacked the brain because it has tricked the brain into thinking that the drug is more important than other things that they should be doing naturally like food, thirst, taking care of your family, going to work, going to school, taking a shower, <laughs> bathing, all of those things are what we would normally do and most of the time imagine taking a, you're all hot and sweaty and you jump in and take a nice shower and you feel all clean and good well there's a little dopamine going on there right well that's not going to be enough dopamine compared to methamphetamine forget that we don't need to bathe we just need more amphetamine so some of the things that people put in their body. For some of you, you go, oh, I've seen those before. Maybe some of you have not. People ingest pills, people smoke cigarettes, people drink alcohol, people snort or inject that white powder. With syringes, all of those are ways in which people can use or get drugs into their system. The faster they get drugs into their system, the more quickly they feel high. Also, the more quickly they come down. And when they come down, what do they have to do? Get more, get more and use again, right? Because the feeling of coming down is not very good. And it doesn't get any better. First people start using to feel good or to feel high. Then they start using to feel normal because they stop feeling high. And then they start using to avoid withdrawal, which is feeling bad. So uh, the, the end result of this is it's not going to work in the long run, but it does work in the short run. By the time you realize what's happening, it's too late. The drug has hijacked your brain. Now, why do some people have brains that are more susceptible than others? So here's what I'm going to do. Okay, I've got people spread out across the aisle here. So if uh, if we could, this side is is number one. You from you over to here is number two and then all of you guys over here is number three okay so when I say number one you guys are gonna go craving let's try it number one craving. oh come on number one craving. all right number two loss of control number two loss of control. oh please number two loss of control. number one craving. number two loss of number three Adverse consequences. Number three. Okay, number two. Number one. Okay, all at once. Okay, now that's what's going on with addiction. Now, you, how many of you have, you said you had an addiction thing, thank you. Anybody else have addiction? You sure? Okay, number one. Number two. Number three. Number 
Number one. Prison. Number two. Awesome. Number three. Awesome. Is that addiction? Yes. Yes. How many of you crave those? Especially right now, yeah, right? right now. Okay. How many of you could eat just one? Oh, look at you all disciplined out there, right? How many of you would keep eating them in spite of putting on the weight or I don't feel so good or right? That's addiction. That's addiction. Now, is that the same as injecting drugs into your vein and getting high? Yes. Interestingly, it's doing the same thing in the brain. I I suppose eventually he could die from a donut overdose. Okay, uh, but but it's the same thing as going on here. Okay, so those three things that we just mentioned: craving, loss of control. What does loss of control mean, by the way? Yeah, no control. Well, it kind of means that, but what else does it mean? No, because actually people with addiction have more willpower than any human being I've ever met. Their willpower is directed solely at acquiring, using, and getting more of the drug. So it's misdirected willpower, right? So loss of control means that I've lost the ability to predict after the first one goes into my mouth because I've craved it, I lose the ability to predict what happens next. I might eat one, like some of you said, and I might eat a dozen. And I don't know which time I'm going to do what. Continuing to use despite adverse consequences. Now this guy obviously has a few of them, right? No. Think about some of the consequences people experience when they use drugs and alcohol or misuse them. Uh, they, they lose their jobs, they have legal problems like they get DUIs or they go to jail or losing their ability to make a living. They may wind up homeless or on the street. They may lose their loved ones and their relationships. They, he says they lose their teeth, which they often do, and their health. And those are just a few. But yet, in spite of all of that, what do they continue to seek and what do they continue to do? Out the drug because their brain has been hijacked and it thinks the drug is still the most important thing. And that's why it's so hard for people who are using drugs and who become addicted to drugs to actually stop. Some of us would say, well, why don't they just stop? Right? How many of you have stopped eating donuts? <laughs> right? If I said, right now, you, you, all of you, you can never have another donut ever again, the first thing you would, yeah, well, I, see, I see that face right there. You're going like, the heck with you, mister. As soon as I get out of here, I'm going to eat a crinkle. Right? So that's difficult for people to stop because their brain is telling them something different because they're experiencing the craving, which is a thought or an urge or a desire. All of you are getting cravings right now. They are experiencing loss of control and they are experiencing this continued use in spite of all of the bad things that might be happening to them and or the people that they love. Because addiction, unfortunately, doesn't just affect the person who has the addiction. It affects everybody that's associated with that person as well. So it's not just something that happens to them. It happens to everybody. So don't let that happen. Kids, don't eat donuts. <laughs> So now here are some things that I am getting close to the wrapping this part up. But uh, so here's some things we know. Science has told us that people who have picked the wrong mother are more prone to addiction. So we know that there is a genetic 
susceptibility to addiction. 50 to 75 percent of the people who develop an addiction have a family history of addiction. Now why is that important? Well from a prevention standpoint, and I'm glad all of you are here because you know adults can tell the kids don't use drugs. They're bad for you and the kids may listen to you but the kids are told by other kids let's do it, let's party, let's get high, let's have fun, all right. And it may seem like a good thing and more than likely at some point most of you will experiment. But if you already know and your parents are here and they're going to they're going to educate you a little bit that if there is a strong family a parent has had a, a drug or alcohol problem, a grandparent, uncles and aunts, cousins, generations, if that tends to run on either side of the family, there's a very strong likelihood that you will have the genetic predisposition. Does that mean you're going to wind up as an addict? No. What it means is that you have a high risk of doing so, so that if you decide at some point to start using drugs and alcohol, it means there's a greater likelihood that you will move on and develop an addiction. Your friend down the street that doesn't have that may not develop an addiction, even though they do the same thing you do. That's not encouraging if you don't have a family history, all right, let's go party. But it does mean that those that have a family history are more at risk. It means that people who grow up in an environment, a house where there's a lot of drug use going on or in a neighborhood where there's a lot of drug use going on, if they are growing up in an unstable uh, home or, or an environment, especially those who are experiencing what we call adverse childhood experiences, abuse, neglect, physical, sexual, or emotional, if they're experiencing uh, other kinds of dysfunction, people that are addicted, people with uh, mental illness, people that are incarcerated. So in other words, there's just a lot of drama and trauma going on. They, that trauma on a developing brain causes the brain to develop in a similar way and be susceptible to addiction just like the genetic factor. The people who have both, the genetic factor and the environmental factor, uh, are extremely at high risk. Those are for sure the ones that we see a lot of in treatment because they're the ones that sort of have the deck stacked against them in, in more ways than one. And then even though a person can develop an addiction at any time, the younger they are when they start, the younger they are when they start. So that's really important because the, those of you that are in here are young and if you start be, any time between now and your mid-twenties, you're actually putting chemicals into a brain that has not yet developed and one that might be susceptible to addiction. So your brain has not finished developing. Some of you may not even know this. How many of you have finished developing your brain? Huh? Yeah, right. Well, it didn't finish until you were about 25. The last part of the brain to develop was called the prefrontal cortex. That's up here. Uh, if that prefrontal cortex has not developed, that's the area of the brain that causes us to pay attention. That's the area of the brain that, that they call it executive function that helps us make decisions. That's the part of the brain that says, you know, that's probably not a good idea to jump off that tall building. The part of our brain that is judgment, impulse control. So now you know why teenagers in particular are the way they are. Part of that is because their brain hasn't developed in such a way yet to allow them to make good strong decisions and control their impulses and their emotions and such. That happens later, but think about it, if I put drugs on that brain before it's developed, it's going to mess up the developing brain and I may be 45, but um, my brain is still 15. 
And we see that a lot when we start treating people with addiction that at least in many ways, while they chronologically may be in their 30s or 40s, emotionally and cognitively, they're still in their teens. Some of them eventually, if they get away from drugs, get clean and sober, will their brain will finish up what it should have finished up many years ago, and others it's fried too many circuits and they're not going to be able to develop that brain. Okay, so now, last slide. I want you all to look at this slide very, very carefully. These are brain scans of brains on drugs. You've all seen that brain and the egg and the frying pan? Well, this is for real. All right, these are actual scans. Now, the two at the top are healthy brain scans. Notice these are images, these aren't actual brains, okay? So when you see the holes, they don't actually have physical holes, they've got functional holes. Those part of the brain, parts of the brain that look like Swiss cheese aren't working, okay? So the 10 years of alcohol, three years of meth, four years of cocaine, and so forth, those are brains that are on drugs. So you gotta decide which brain do you want. Do you want the one at the top or do you want one of those? All right. So, questions? <laughs>